Good evening, everyone, and welcome to um, the final edition of Collage Live Online for this, this season. And this is Navigating Digital and Cultural Worlds with Lisa Wicca and David Wisher. Um, and if you're playing along in the drinking game, I, <laughs> I can't read my script. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so Collage Live Online is a virtual series of programs by Collage Institute that seeks to deepen our understanding of collage as a medium, as genre and community and a 21st century movement. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the presenters and then we're going to move on to a video that they've produced for us this evening. Lisa Wicca. Lisa Wicca is a mixed media printmaker and educator. Her work revolves around the manipulation of the self through experience, place, failures, and successes, often referencing architectural spaces, wallpapers, and raw materials. Her work plays with perspective, dimension, fragility, and time. Wicca graduated with her BFA from the University of Central Florida and her MFA from Purdue University. She's currently assistant professor of printmaking at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. David Wisher, uh, received his BFA in graphic design from Northern Kentucky University and his MFA in fine art from Purdue University. He is currently an assistant professor of digital and print media at the University of Kentucky, where he teaches courses on zine publication, screen printing, and graphic design. His work has recently been exhibited at the Center for Book Arts in New York, the Four Rivers Print Biennial at Southern Illinois University, and uh, the International Print Center, New York. And so, um, like I said, the first part of the session is a video that Lisa and David made of their discussion. And we'd like you to be part of this event by posting questions in the chat or using the Q&A function. And Lisa and David will respond at the end of the video. So take it away. I'll give a little background on, on you and I. We were both uh, grad students at Purdue University you were a year behind me. So if I have the dates correct, I started in 2009. Yep. And then you started in 2010. So I made the CMYK print, which turned into a larger version of that, which was called Davy Swine Flu. Um, started swiping other uh, student pictures school pictures from friends and family, but turned into this series where I was adding things to other people's pictures based on what I knew about them. I started looking into like the way photo montage and photoshopping images in school pictures was a thing that still happens now, where parents can choose to, uh, erase birthmarks from their children or like trim their hair a little bit this and that which is like when we when I was a kid it was just like you look like a goofball that day you're going to be a goofball yeah. in this photo for the rest of your life um, but I think just because I came from that background of graphic design there was a there was like this use of photoshop that I had been using in my career before grad school that was to make things presentable to clean things up and then to start using it as an art form, but in a way that I really wanted to make them look real. So yeah, it's something we can talk about throughout this, I think is this idea of like digital and analog, digital collage, at what point does collage become photo montage or like an art form if you're making something look more presentable or if you're like erasing a birthmark is that collage or photo montage yeah. i mean there's not a correct answer is there no but it's worth i think there might be a correct about. answer yeah maybe somebody will be listening and it's like i know the answer yeah, yeah. yeah. um <laughs> if you have the correct answer put it in the comments <laughs> Uh, so something as you you were talking that I, I'd like to just talk about a little bit is you taught me how to screen print. Oh, yeah, and I, I, I remember. I mean, I I... 
Yeah, I didn't, I came in with, I think, etching and relief and some hand, a lot of hand coloring, uh, working without a studio for a long time. I think we both had that kind of gap in between undergrad and, mm -hmm. and grad school. Um, but yeah, you taught me how to screen print and I distinctly remember you, you teaching me and then a short while later, I went off and was doing my thing, printing that mix and match series. Yeah. I was taking um, images and digitally collaging them, um, fragmented figures, kind of creating these sort of beautiful monsters. And I was printing them. And I remember you came up and you were like, I have no idea what you're even doing. Like, this isn't what I taught you. <laughs> were you doing it wrong? No, but I was like mixing different, like breaking from CMYK. I was like, oh, yeah. you know, uh, not pulling all the way through and like, you know, doing weird stuff. And because I was printing those really large too. So I was mm -hmm. having to take like one chunk of the body per like screen and then four screen. So it became like this. Yeah, I remember now. The way that I... They, I mean, they started off as photographs, then they became digital collages. Then the way I printed them was also like you would collage. Like I was printing like chunk by chunk and like hand registering them because of the size. So for me, that form of, of printing those was so similar to collage because I could instinctively like move things around um, this, these sort of fragmented chunks that just seemed to, to mimic the whole process of collage, whether it was digital or, or hand cut. How does the multiple play an important part in your work, especially as it relates to collage? A lot of my work is just one ofs, unless I'm participating maybe in a portfolio exchange or something like that. But what a big part of why I love printmaking is we do have the ability to make um, to make things multiple times. So in a lot of my work, you'll look at um, if we look at like that shape series of mine. Uh, there's a lot of patterns that repeat, and they repeat not only like they exist in more than one piece, but they're printed different ways. So they're printed in different colors, different different layers. Uh, or, you know, stacked on top of each other. Sometimes they stand alone. So what I enjoy about the multiple is I can create this one thing and then I can print it in a variety of different ways, in multiple, right, in multiple ways. So for me, that becomes very important um, part of my practice because then I can develop, I essentially work to develop this library of colors and pattern and um, some of those patterns exist in multiple piles because they're printed in different ways. I think I have a similar answer, but in, in this respect, I think our work is like very different because I feel like the multiple, having multiples of something or being able to create several of them make them like less precious in a way. Um, and specifically, I'm thinking about the, my conversations, it's like these two collages that are like facing each other. I, I made them for a show called Conversation. So each artist is a printmaking show. So each printmaker was creating, um, two pieces that were having a conversation with each other. And I took it quite literally in that these two faces are facing each other and then trying to create compositions that were balanced and equal but opposite and in that respect that they're like the colors are even but the um parts of the images um are kind of having these opposing um parts of a dialogue can i ask a question that branches off from this or sure. Can I, yeah. just from what you said, let me say something. For sure. So I mentioned earlier that like I don't edition that much. That's not super true because right behind me, like these are a series of risographs that were, there are an edition of 50 each. So I think it really does depend on the project. Um, and these were made with the intention of them being lower in price point too. Uh, but you and I both also do 
a lot of work in Photoshop and Illustrator. So these behind me there that along the way Rizograph uh, series was done pretty much exclusively in Photoshop, but still using some traditional technique. So like scraps of drawings got scanned in, right? So I'm bringing physical marks that I've made in other ways, scanning them in and bringing them in digitally. So even when I am working primarily in, in Photoshop or Illustrator, there's still that like combination of usually some, you know, something that feels digital, something that feels like, um, you know, hand drawn, something that feels like smeared charcoal, you know, something like that all coexisting. What was the question that you were going to ask me? I was talking about planning everything out on the computer and then having like my output is like this very sort of like um, robotic function of like how perfect can I print this screen print to how it looks like on a screen. I'm curious if your work, how spontaneous is the construction of all these different printed and drawn parts? Do you have a particular... Uh, so so my, I think they were called structures. Oh. You did in Sweden? Yeah. When I work with those collages, uh, that those were intense, right? Those were uh, pretty large and a lot of little pieces. But even looking at the, kind of my recent, a little more simplified pieces, I have no idea what they're going to look like. Uh, but what I do have is all of this stuff. So I think I've kind of, um, I'm going to start talking a little maybe about appropriation here. Mm -hmm. So with that, with the work I did in Sweden, first of all, uh, with some things I said before about like recognizing, you know, where I feel, what makes me feel comfortable, what makes me feel anxious. I feel a lot of this when I am in new places. So a lot of times my work significantly changes when I do like residencies or something like that because I'm, I'm putting myself in this position where I am uncomfortable and I have to like figure it out. I have to find like what is comfortable for me here and then I'll notice like what maybe reminds me of something else. Was that a good feeling or a bad feeling and kind of it forces me to acknowledge those those responses. So when I was in Sweden, I would go a lot for walks. I would take pictures. Um, I was working very directly with architectural references at that time. Um, and thinking of not only uh, my own baggage right, that I carry with me, but even included in that is people. Because I made this work very paying attention to my surroundings, they they feel very similar right and the when it wasn't until i like laid everything out that i realized how many blues i had and how often this um kind of pale yellow or sometimes even like a ochre yellow would come up or this really um kind of soft orange of like sunsets there so these colors just happened and this happens wherever I go. I don't really plan for a particular, um, a particular color story, like in that work, it just happens as I'm paying attention around me. I mean, I've even noticed places where there's that one I did in that series that's Chicago. And that one, it's the, the really uh, horizontal one, that one automatically got these like, colder grays and some like steel blues in there uh, because it, that's it reflects like the city where if you look at one that I did that reflected like Marinette that one has these kind of warmer brick colors so I'm pulling like directly from that and just collecting so when I do residency sometimes it's a little stressful because I don't actually make finished pieces right away like I spend a lot of time just making little like, hey, today I'm going to make some flat colors. I'm just going to print some some flats. And then the next day, you know, maybe I'll do an etching of this cool like building that stuck out to me. And then I just start creating these piles. I remember I did 
uh, that merge series started at Sparkbox Studio in Canada. And I was only there for two, two weeks, maybe even like 10 days or something like that. But the people that run Sparkbox Studio there, I think that first week were like, what is she doing? Like, cause nothing was coming together. Like I was just printing flats, like their whole studio was made out of um, chipboard, like unpainted chipboard or like one area is white painted chipboard. So I was like hand drawing like chipboard and then burning that into a screen and printing it. I was printing flat colors. They had this really interesting wallpaper in the, in the house that I was staying in. So I kind of like reinterpreted that and was printing just flat. So I just had like all this stuff and I swear it was down. It was down to like the last couple days of like not really getting much sleep or anything to finally start bringing that work together. Um, yeah, so it just, it just kind of keeps happening until I reach that point where I'm like, okay, now, now's the time to sit down and start thinking about how these shapes, how these colors can work together. So I want to go back to appropriation. Um, when I think of the work that I'm making, I'm, I'm definitely appropriating parts of buildings, patterns, those sorts of things. But for me, it's, it's important for me to recognize that I'm, I don't feel I'm ever seeing something genuinely, like for the first time. I'm, I bring all this stuff to it. So very rarely am I taking a pattern that exists, let's say a wallpaper, and using that actual wallpaper to collage. And an example would be, um, there is some work that I did where I have this floral pattern that's like really pink and blue. That pattern was originally taken from like a 60s home, like 60s brown and green and orange wallpaper. But for me, I'm not a child of the 60s. So I interpreted in this way that was almost like 90s colors. Um, so it's kind of the merging of those two things together. So I'm appropriating um, things that I'm seeing around me, but I am very aware that I, I prefer to filter them um, through my own experience and they often you know, change along the way. What I think of as appropriation, uh, looking at your work, is maybe like a similar, right? A similar thing, would you agree or, or disagree with that? I'm thinking uh, maybe specifically that Twitter Me This series of yours. Yeah, I, I appropriating that is, I've mentioned it earlier, but like translating, like how can I translate these things that I see into my own stylistic works? Um, so those begin as, uh, obviously, like, I'm inspired by how random my Twitter feed becomes on certain days when there's, like, tragedy happening and a, a pet video and a GIF that doesn't necessarily, isn't supposed to relate to those things, but kind of does, um, in some weird way, which you mentioned the other day is like kind of another version of collage is putting these kind of like incongruous things next to each other on top of each other and they start telling their own story. But as I'm yeah, I notice it a lot in Instagram, like scrolling oh, and for sure. how like similar things will start to pull together. And then there's an ad in there for something that's like, um, you didn't choose, but like, so like, a couple months ago, I, I just did a simple ch uh, search for cheap eyeglasses. And then the next two weeks of my life were just like eyeglass ads, like smacking me in the face every single where, place that I went on the internet. So you, you sort of are still choosing all those things, even though they seem kind of random. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that kind of appropriation is... It is my kind of like illustrative stylistic change to actual things that exist. Whereas um, the 
the sort of like installation work social circle, which is the magazine pieces with the screen print on them. I'm using actual, you know, mag pages from magazines, actual advertising, ad advertisements from the 60s and 70s. Their appropriation obviously is this huge part of my work. Whenever I'm talking to my students about appropriation, because of course I have to talk about like um, the difference between appropriating and stealing. You want people to understand the changes that you made in the work and understand why you made those changes and not, um, you know, if you're going to take someone's photo, you don't want someone to say, that's a great photo because it's not your photo. It's, it's what you do with it. So trying to come up with like a new recontextualization of the image um, that says what you want to say, that's what's important with appropriation. But, you know, with the social circle piece, I just love those images, you know, like those um, ridiculous advertisements from the like 60s, you know, mm -hmm. uh, airline advertisements, TV advertisements, these things are just like, they're funny um, anyway. And so then to add like the mask to them and uh, sort of put them all together in this installation just kind of heightens the like uh, the humor that I already see in them. I want us to tell each other what our favorite works are by each other. Okay. I'll start. Okay. Um, I love your focus series and I have questions about it. Yes. Where did you come up with this idea to use viewfinders? I think what happened is the photos came first. So this work started again at a residency. I was working out of the Lower East Side print shop in New York for a month in the summer. And I had this, I, I kind of had this idea going in. So I came with some, um, some things of making these fragmented, uh, somewhat domestic feeling spaces. Um, and reflecting on my time in New York, some things I was attracted to, um, and you can see in some other work I made during this time is, you know, wallpaper, some, but like the tin tiles in ceilings that have pattern. And then often in like apartment buildings there, there's like that same sort of texture on the wall that's just been painted like a million times. Not all the patterns that you see are from that specific place. Some are, but some are from uh, like that minty green. I'm looking at focus one, mm -hmm. that minty green pattern, uh, that color in particular comes from how I remember my very first childhood home. We used to call it the little green house. Um, so I made these little houses and some, I made them in a way that they could be photographed from the outside or the inside. And I, I bought these little like dollhouse windows. So mm -hmm. these are really just made up out of foam core dollhouse windows and then um, paint and collaged prints. Um, so Lisa looking real cool, like carried these little houses around New York City and like stuck them in random place in, places and was taking photographs. Sometimes I would have a friend you see in Focus 2, that black and white one. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually my friend Melissa's hands <laughs> holding, holding that up. But it was a way to bring my own space into this other place, right? In a very literal kind of sense. The fact that this work could be carried is, is meaningful to me in, in, in this sort of process. So I was like, what if it was really small and you could carry it with you easily? So you could have this experience kind of anywhere. Um, so then that, that brought me to the viewfinders, um, but for it to feel complete, I decided to do these uh, wall pieces. So not only is it the wall piece addressing, um, you know, what's on the inside as far as what the house is, but it's addressing the whole environment inside. 
So you can see the like pink in the back of that like minty green I was talking about. You see that kind of salmony pink color mm -hmm. pops right back up into the physical wall piece. So the, that piece is almost like me processing the, that little house in, in its space, but then taking it and bringing it into a new one, you know, a gallery space or something like that. There is a particular series that sticks out to me as one of, uh, one of my favorites of yours, if you could talk about a little more, and that's the True American series. I yeah. think part of the reason for me that that stands out to me is I remember talking to you a little while you were making this um, and it being a whole new experience for you, a whole different way of working. And I think that the point where you made this, it was a pretty significant departure from some of the other work that you were making. So if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's definitely different. Um, and I think I perceive this as like a completely different way of working than other people do because when I hear other people speak about this, they still bring in a lot of the stuff that I do with my other work, like this kind of like uh, levity or humor. And I, I never found these funny. I think there's like, um, well, they're called true Americans because I wanted to do this series of like portraiture I wanted to think about celebrity as this, this sort of curse in a way and find these celebrities who had like, not like the ideal celebrity experience, like something about them in the public eye was like, like went wrong or they had hardship or something like that. So the series itself is born out of like complete frustration with a process that I wasn't all that familiar with and couldn't perfect. And that was darkroom photography. So I, I started, I took photography a long, long, long time ago. And at UK, we have a darkroom. We have a really nice darkroom setup. So I thought I have this camera and I'm going to shoot some film and learn again how to, use the darkroom, which is like another way of making multiples. It's not that different than printmaking. The, the two processes cross over in so many different ways, but I could not make a print that I was satisfied with. So I started chopping up negatives. So this was a way to spontaneously, I mean, I talked about how everything is so planned out with me, but I could sort of spontaneously cut up these negatives, tape them back together, you never really know what they're going to look like until they're scanned in. The images on top are like screen printed half tones, um, but they are a departure from what I was doing because I was like brand new to the process, mm -hmm. and that was really exciting for me. Um, and it turned into a few other pieces um, that don't have screen print on them, although some of the negative other negative collages I did I ended up screen printing so that was kind of interesting in taking negative collages um, scanning them in creating my own half tones printing them um, but yeah it was like I want to I'm using this distorted face again it's kind of like this these images that are taken apart like on um, uh, split decision, which is Muhammad Ali. What can I take away to where like you can still tell who he is? There's these allusions to crying in some of them that I think don't, they don't really come through, but like the Marilyn Monroe and has like these cut tears coming out of her eyes. The Muhammad Ali has these lines. Average Marks has these paint marker lines coming down his cheeks um ain't no sunshine has like the single triangle teardrop confession culture has the same thing yeah and then the the piece is called true americans and the uh sort of like the 
the first piece of the series is which is also called true americans doesn't have a figure in it but is just a collage of negatives in this kind of abstract american flag um made out of photos but i think mostly it is just like blank um film that has paint marker with lines scratched into it so i did have one more question surprise Surprise me. question. Mm -hmm. Has your work changed during the coronavirus? Has it changed? Yeah. It's had to change. How so? Um, you, you know, I, you're probably the same way. Work mostly out of the studio where we teach and didn't really have access for a while. Um, I'm just, I've really gotten into uh, the the accessibility of just like picking up an iPad or actually a lot of the images I've been making risographs of lately are drawn on my phone. So there's a Procreate uh, app. I think it's called Pocket Procreate possibly. But so a lot of these things are just drawn with my finger on my phone. One of the pieces that I made recently is just a reaction to what's going on with with the the pandemic and and people who are sort of like putting their needs above everybody else's so uh I'll show an image of it but it's a a drawing of essentially just like a snippet of a conversation um so you you um used this word earlier and I wrote it down um, which was the pub the public eye yeah and I thought ah that's that's a phrase that really encapsulates a lot of your work kind of like criticizing or uh, highlighting the absurdity of of the public eye right and that's ridiculous things and that's really serious things and sometimes it's both of those, right? It's both of those things. Um, so I think I see some of that, you know, or the potential of some of that bubbling up in this time for you too. Um, it is like 50-50 of like really soul crushing sort of societal things that are happening. And then, um, you know, like a silly, um, like a monkey uh, driving a moped. Mm -hmm. Those are two things that take up equal space yeah. on a Twitter feed or whatever yeah. it is. And I don't know, maybe we would go absolutely crazy if we didn't have the monkey riding the moped to sort of just balance out, balance it out. Yeah, everything else. This is where I put a video of a monkey riding a moped. Yeah. All right, that was the video. Thank you guys. That was great. Uh, so we're gonna do some question and answer. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat and I'm gonna ask the ones that you guys have already asked. Um, so uh, we have a question here from Catherine. Uh, she asked it before we even got started uh, about preparing manual collage elements for RisoPrint. Uh, do you just use trace to lay out the different layers or is there another method you found helpful? Mine are completely digital. So I wonder, Lisa, if you do more manual drawing. Um, yeah, I do. I do more, more manual things. And then when I am using digital, I'm often scanning in manual things. Um, I mean, some of those, like in those risographs, like large flat shapes, I'm, I'm usually creating digitally, but um, a lot of the texture you see is something I'm doing manually. Yeah, I, I've only used the risograph that we have at school. So it creates a half tone. It creates like a very fine half tone. So you can print digitally. Um, and so somebody just asked about the teeth drawings. Those were mine drawn uh, with my finger on my phone. And then um, 
basically I just create like a black and white PDF of them and print them on the Rizzo. But I have students who do things by hand and scan them in and print them that way too. But on the teeth, the the teeth print, you could see the how uh, fine the halftone is because the the mouths look a little smeared, which is kind of something I don't usually use in my work. So that's pretty new. Wanted to ask, uh, I wanted to ask what, um, what programs are you using uh, to make some of these? Uh, and actually, I wanted maybe a little more specific. Is there a program that you absolutely love, you can't live without? And are there any programs that you've tried that you just like didn't gel with? David, do you want to go first? Well, I, I, I kind of mix them all together. I, like I said in the video, I have a, a background in graphic design. It's what I studied in undergrad. And I, I, I drew an illustrator all day at a job for eight years before going to back to school. And so I got, I just really, I love drawing an illustrator so much so that I can't sort of settle into one style in Illustrator, which is a little frustrating because I'm constantly, especially because I teach it also. So I'm always finding new things to sort of um, uh, work with an Illustrator, but I, I really mix Photoshop, Illustrator, and then now Procreate, and uh, maybe that's it. Maybe those are the three. What about you, Lisa? Um, so uh, they're usually Photoshop, Illustrator, some Premiere. My undergraduate degree actually had some uh, focus was on animation. Um, so I have some work that we didn't talk about that's kind of in, in the works. And one thing I know, David, both you and I did play around with was called Artivive, uh, which is an app on your yeah. that you can project. You can project like video onto a 2D surface. And that is one I want to play around with more. I think you get like three, three things for free before you have to pay for it. And I know David, you had some luck with that too. Yeah, uh, is that the, is it, I think I used that in Ireland last yeah. summer, right? I've really only done one and I, I honestly, I forget that I, that it's a thing, but every time I come across that video, it's pretty amazing. So it's called Artivive, right? Yeah. Which is a strange name, but, uh, yeah, that is, I, I would suggest anybody who works digitally and sort of creates animations, um, it's fun to play around with. Yeah, I mean, I've been, I've been toying with this idea of, right, I talk so much about space, but acknowledging like digital virtual space too. And so trying to get those two things to coexist uh, is a struggle, right? So I have also been playing with some like projection mapping, which is essentially what that Art of Vive is too. Um, and one that I've been using is Mad Mapper. There is a, a, a free version. No, is there? There maybe is a free version or there's like a monthly subscription that's not that expensive um, that I've had. It's, it's a pretty user friendly. I've had some pretty good results with it, but uh, I just need to dedicate the time really to, to working on that because I am pretty excited. I see some like virtual virtual things um, but I, I like thinking of that combination of like a flat print, but then through, you know, a projection through your phone or something like that, there's this other component to it. I think that's all the program. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, uh, Holly asks, uh, David, do you think that collage can also be conceptual in your work? Uh, this comedic structure ideology seems to embrace an infrastructure similar to physical collage. Can collage be conceptual in like a humorous way? Yeah, I think that's what she's asking. Yeah, I, I actually think um, it's really difficult to make things like pleasantly funny with collage. I think honestly, that's why I think, um, I mean, I do a lot of drawings that I, you saw some of them at the end of this, but I do a lot of silly drawings. And <clears throat> honestly, for the past few weeks, I've been trying to draw like, uh, just like the happiest things I can think of. And most of them are like clown faces, which still end up scary. So I don't know. I don't know if like, uh, when you start cutting up faces, it's really hard to put that back together in a, in a way that doesn't look like disfigured. But I find it funny. I don't know if other people find it funny. Like um, I've 
been told I have a dark sense of humor, so maybe that's why I find it funny. Maybe that's my new challenge, is to make something pleasantly funny with, uh, with like uh, analog collage. Yeah, I'd like to see that. Yeah, <laughs> it'll look scary. <laughs> uh, some scary things are funny. Um, I think so. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> uh, Mikey asks um, if either of you had a chance to mess around with Adobe Fresco. Uh, it has live brushes that let you use oil and watercolor brushes. Fresco, this is the first I've heard of this. Yeah, I've never heard of it either. I haven't heard of it. I'm going to look it up though. Thank you, Mikey. <laughs> I know, David, you and I have talked, I've been wanting to play around with Adobe character, um, where you can like assign eyes, nose and mouth, and it'll kind of respond to your video. And I've been wanting to play with that, like in an abstract way, like take a chunk of a pattern and say it's an eyeball and like see what happens, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, there's so many, there's so many things to try out. So little time. No. Yeah, uh, that uh, then that program you just brought up uh, made me think about there's there was a lot of um, talk in your discussion uh, that sort of related to synchronicity. Um, and then David, you said, you know, you plan all this stuff out, but then you were also talking about the um, Twitter, Twitter me this is that what it was called. Mm -hmm. um, and how you were like seeing these things in con like in conjunction on your Twitter feed that just like didn't add up, but then you mesh them together. Mm -hmm. um, so like there was this, so you sort of let go of the plan in that way. And I think that's uh, something that like a lot of collage artists use that, that happenstance, that happy accident. Yeah. I think, rant, you know, I talk to my students a lot about play being playful and, and um, <clears throat> sort of like turning failure into like just something new, you know, it's hard to take risks and, and with collage, I think that's really necessary especially manual collage. I mean, a lot of the work that I showed during this is digital. And in that sense, I do have like a safety net where I can save like lots of different versions of things. And like today I was working on something for a print exchange and I dug through old files to find patterns that I used, which is probably the same thing as Lisa going through what do you keep your patterns in? Like a shoe box or something? Uh, Tupperware, Ziplocs. All yeah. <laughs> See, I use hard drives. Lisa uses <laughs> Tupperware bins. It's the same thing. But yeah, I think chance, I mean, how many times, I can't tell you how many times I've accidentally pasted something in the wrong, on the wrong layer or on the wrong file and I, and it lands in the middle or something. And I'm just like, that looks amazing. And then that begins a new piece. So, you know, it is a lot of the reason I, I like collage is that it's about putting, like solving a puzzle or putting together something and not, I mean, I'm just not that excited about creating entirely new things. I never have been. I like digging through other people's stuff and trying to make it into something different. I think that's what a lot of collage artists do. I think David, you and I talked a little bit about like the, the frustration that can come along with that process. And sometimes those pieces die, right? But oh, yeah. and sometimes they get to a point where you're like, you know, okay. And then so often that's the piece, right? Everyone's mm -hmm. like, whoa. And you're like, I want to punch that piece in the face, yeah. but everybody else, right? Everybody else. Yeah, I was telling Lisa as a designer, I talked to my students about like, do not throw in, if somebody asks for five ideas and you only have four, don't just throw something in that you hate because they will pick that one. And then you have to work on it for a month more and then people expect you to do it again. So yeah, it's kind of the same thing. This is a question that we get a lot. Um, and I think it's something that a lot of collage artists think about. Um, do you guys consider uh, copyright or run into any issues with copyright when you use photos from magazines or books or anything like that? I think I would, I think I would if I was making um, a lot of them and I was making a lot of money with them. Uh, but I try not to, <clears throat> I mean, I've had that concern. I've actually talked to uh, a couple of 
people that I know who do law and one in particular does copyright law. So it is a concern and it's something that I'm, I definitely talk to my students about. Like, um, I don't know. I don't think any of the work that I showed is necessarily at risk of that. Me this I used to try to get it sued by Wendy's for a long time though. I was really like wearing out the Wendy's logo like 10 years ago, trying to try and, I mean, I could probably now that they are like, uh, roasting people on Twitter all day, but back then, no. I'm sure, if you, I'm sure if you went with like a Disney image, they would they would give you a message. I've actually, I have banned Disney from my classes. Like students cannot do Disney themed infographics or anything like that because yeah, Disney will come for you. You could be a poor college student and they'll, they'll take you down. <laughs> I think uh, for me, I'm often transforming existing things um so that's not that much of an issue and then in pieces where i am using like uh legs and things like that those are ones that i'm taking so those are my photos i i man i creep around what a creepy thing so mm. i <laughs> i go and i like sneaky take photos i sneaky hide little houses it takes guts <laughs> um so yeah i don't really worry about it that much until somebody is like, those are my legs, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, I've got a few simple questions uh, mm -hmm. that you, you, you all answered, I think, in the chat, but just for anybody who's not following along in the chat. Um, Christine so asks, dark in here. Uh, Lisa, do you love monoprint because it's original? Um, that's, <laughs> that's complicated. That word original in printmaking is, is because even if it is multiple, they're still originals. Uh, the original multiple because I'm hand printing all of them. Um, but in the sense that like I only, you know, often I'm only making one of something and I, I kind of briefly answered that in there. It's, it's more because of my process. I can be pretty controlling in, in my process and I find if I, if I let myself do that, I will complete the task as planned and it's not as interesting. So I kind of control my uh, library as much as I can and then I like to kind of let go and and be able to move things around and you know cut things and play with it so that sort of playfulness I think just ends up resulting in mono prints more so than me valuing one more than the other yeah I use I use mono prints only like usually only in the animation so I use those are trace monotypes that are um, sort of like the line the moving part of the animations. So I do use them in like a strictly sort of utilitarian way. Like the, I need one of them and I need a lot of them. You know, some of those animations are like 48 prints looped. And so it just sort of functions um, really easily in that respect. And it does create like an interesting line quality, which I'm sure I could make and procreate, but same thing. Oh, and uh, Daphna uh, posted the a link for fair use guidelines for anybody who's worried about uh, copyright. I Good. almost called Thank her you. out on that because um, I know she had that link ready at her event last time. Um, so Todd Bartell uh, says, uh, so much of what you both do celebrates drawing. Uh, all collage is drawing, he tells his students. Uh, but I wonder how do you define and think about drawing in your respective work? Hmm. Lisa, do you remember how Charles Gick defined drawing in grad school? No, I don't. I think it was him. He said it was the act of dr of dragging one thing across another across another thing. I remember. Which I loved. I was like, oh my god, I'm drawing all day with my feet. This is amazing. I remember Catherine, and maybe Catherine Rees. Maybe she's in this. I'm not sure. Uh, Hi, but Catherine. Catherine. Hi, if you're there, talking about mailing envelopes like mailing an envelope from one person to another person and is that a drawing because you've created this line and i even talked to my students like did i just draw like with my hands right because something's like moving through um, you've moving. done like light drawing in your right like you've yeah. drawn with light in your classes mm -hmm. and things like that yep i forget uh, the original question christopher i'm sorry yeah, what do you de how do you define uh drawing in your own work I mean, I guess I, 
I think a lot about like when I'm teaching drawing and when I'm making my work, I think a lot about my body and like how it relates to, uh, right, relates to the space around me or how I'm, how I'm moving my body to make certain, certain marks that I would just say that's an important part of, of my work is kind of just recognizing that I like the marks that, that come right that that come from me um, in the drawing and that's maybe part of the reason another part of the reason I like taking existing things but then kind of recreating them I feel like I I learn about them I understand them and they kind of end up changing through uh, through me and through my through my hands and that does end up being a lot of drawing and then kind of turning into print from there. I don't know if that super answers it, but yeah, I, I would say uh, like today I, I I sat here and worked for a few hours on a, a print and it was mostly, um, I don't think any of the stuff was shown in this, but I've been working with like grids and illustrator and then sort of moving points in strange ways to create lines. And I consider that drawing. It's not even, I mean, it's literally just clicking and dragging points for a while. But I, uh, I, I've, I've, I talk about this a lot. I work in a lot of different styles. I think Lisa, you do too. Like we kind of, especially like the procreate stuff now is much different because, and I have like really put off learning procreate because I've, since I've had an iPhone for, I don't know how many years, there's a lot of drawing apps that have come out and they're just not good. But the moment I opened Procreate, I was like, oh my gosh, like you can simulate, you know, smudging and, and um, I sort of bring things into Photoshop and mess with uh, like layers to create um, like transparency and showing the paper through it. And all that is just manipulated on a computer, but it's, it feels like drawing to me. Yeah, and I, I guess maybe with that person, and the, the question too about talking about collage as drawing is oh. when I use an exacto knife. <laughs> yeah, it's the same. It's the same act, right? I think I'm, so. I'm, I'm drawing a line and how I'm cutting. So, yeah, yeah a lot of the like 35 millimeter um, collages, those were, you know, I was using paint markers, scraping away at it, and things like that. I, you know, I would definitely consider that drawing. I don't have a lot of rules though, to be honest. Like I define things in these very, even with my students, it's, I give them a, an assignment and if they wanna conceptualize something and make it totally different, if they can, if they can uh, talk the talk, I'm, I'm down for it, so. And then, um, so you, uh, when, did, when did you um, record that discussion? Saturday? Okay. Yeah, I think last Saturday. Yeah, it was about two hours. Mm -hmm. At least I had this great idea. I think it's because we wanted to be able to show work, but we, I didn't want to be fumbling with like sharing things. And I, I think it was a, a great idea. So it was like two hours. I cut out all as many of me saying um and like as I could, but I had to leave so many in. So. Well, I felt like we could be a little, I think, more like candid too. Like it was relaxed. We, we didn't feel like we were restrained to time. Um, so we kind of mm -hmm. just, yeah, just talked for about two hours and then David, thank you, David, did a good job of like putting everything together and adding the images. Yeah, it came out great. The video looks great. Uh, all you. the work is well put in there. Um, and I, what I wanted to ask is now you've had some days between the discussion and today, is there anything that you want to ask now? Like, is there anything that you want to follow up on that you feel like uh, got left out? Mm. Uh, we did leave so much out. Yeah. Um, or even like a question for each other, you know, I, I liked that you asked uh, each other about your, your favorite works. That was a good one. That was a Dave, David's idea of that question. Oh yeah. Let's do the first collage one. I wanted to oh, ask each yes. other what our first collage was. Yeah, and Lisa, Lisa told a very funny story. Yeah, <laughs> Go so ahead. Lisa, Lisa what was your first collage? Sure. So I remember being, um, somewhere between the ages of four and six and it was uh, April Fool's. It was April Fool's Day. And I got this genius idea. Four-year-old, six-year-old, whatever, genius idea, which was to 
cut a piece of black construction paper out like a rough circle and put it on the floor and try to convince my dad that there was a hole in the floor. <laughs> so it wasn't until my, like only recently, only like a couple years ago, did I reflect on this and think, oh my God, <laughs> like I was cutting paper and I was pl playing with dimension, right? I was trying to like convince you this is a, a three like a, phase. It's like a Looney, a Looney Tunes <laughs> trick. That's what I do. Um, <laughs> with young, young Wiley Coyote, or yeah, this is straight out of the Acme playbook. Yeah. 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 So yes, that's what I consider my my first. But see, my answer was like high school. So I was like already thinking like uh, like in a class or something. And then Lisa was like, I cut a hole in a piece of paper, which is totally valid. But I feel like I didn't really make a lot of art through high school. I wanted to be like a writer and stuff. So me and a friend of mine made a uh, a zine that we we made about eight issues of it. And so that really was like pre-digital. So we were chopping up magazines and then we would uh, photocopy them at my, at his dad's office. And they were each like 12 pages and we'd sell them at school. It was, uh, so that was like, I didn't realize I was doing like collage and um, graphic design at the time. We just wanted to like make people read our stupid like top 10 lists and that's really like fake David Letterman stuff that we were putting together. I mean, David, maybe that transitions nicely into your work with zines. That's not something that we talked mm. about too much. Yeah, the zines that I make, which I, I mean, the, some of those last drawings that were on there, the dog and the teeth and those are part of a um, zine I'm working on now that's just all... Uh, it's called Ring, 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 and it's all phone drawings from like the last couple months. Um, but most of my zines are like a lot of failures, uh, projects I never finished. The first one I made when we got a risograph at school was called, un, uh, it was like subtitled Unfinished Business. So it's like, I think of zines as this way to throw together a lot of all this stuff that I've always tried to make work together my collages and drawings and photos and all these things. And, um, you know, if you print them in like the same two colors, suddenly they look great together. So those are sort of what my zines are. And I teach zines at UK. So it's interesting. I've got students learning more about collage in my zine class than they do in probably any other class. Cause I, we talk about the Dada artists and Kurt Schwitters and all these great, uh, early collage artists. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's great. I think I think I think if you asked a lot of artists like about their childhood art, that you would find like interesting connections between what they were doing then and what they're doing now. Just like both of your stories. Yeah, um, my, I mean, talking about like wanting to be a writer and and things like that. Like my my mom found a bunch of like these really bad lists of things that I wrote when I was a kid. I mean, and I'm a list maker now, but I, I don't remember writing these things, but it was just like papers of like lists of colors, lists of numbers. Like, what was I doing? I needed the internet back then, but I didn't have it. I remember I also made this pop-up book and for like 20 years after I made it, I remembered it as like the most awesome pop-up book ever. And then I actually saw it and it was like, a piece of paper with a cut and then like just a tab that slid across with like a fox on it yes. but for like 20 years i thought of it like man that, that book was so good until i actually saw it so yeah it could have been published yeah, today one of those things right me thinking that was so good like has taken me to um to where i am now who knows uh, awesome. Uh, so I think we're going to uh, wrap it up. Is there anything that either of you would like to plug? Uh, anything that you're working on right now? Well, Kath Catherine Bird, hi. She just asked, and I might have missed a lot of questions. I don't know. We'll, Lisa and I will stick around. Chris, yeah. Lisa, the, the chat will yeah, be Yeah, we'll open, keep the so. chat open. And so uh, they'll answer some questions in the chat. Answer some keep questions. Asking. But I will just say I have a few things uh, on my website, davidwisher.com. I don't have the new one up because uh, uh, I can't. I can't finish printing it because my students won't get off the risograph, but when they're done with their project, I'll finish my book. But I do have a few on there and um, we both have 
Instagrams that you could see um, other work. I'm at Wisher. Lisa, you are. At Elwitha. Elwitha. I'm posting it in the chat right now. Oh, good. But um, yeah, what else do we have to plug? Um, I have on the 2nd, October 2nd, I'm in a three-person show uh, through James May Gallery here in Wisconsin on Artsy. So I'll post that link in here as well. Um, yeah, some of the work, a few of the pieces that were shown tonight will be in that. I just randomly saw, have you been to Burning Man? Is that for me? I have not been to Burning Man. <laughs> yeah. I've been to the original Lollapalooza. That was probably close. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh, I'm in a show at, um, it's a great online exhibition and there's lots of other great printmakers, photographers. It's Moreland Gallery, M-O-R-L-A-N. I'll put the link in here in a minute, uh, but it's Transylvania University here in Lexington. And um, so a lot of the work I showed here is in that, but it's a great, great online show, especially if you are looking for a way to have a show work online Anthony Mead is the art is the uh, gallery director there, and he did an amazing, amazing job. So I'll put a link to that also. Awesome. Well, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, David. This was great. Uh, thank this you. is our this is our final collage live event uh, of the summer. I, we're going to probably do more events like this in the future, but nothing quite as extensive as this summer program was. Um, so thank you, everybody who joined us for any one of these events, and especially to those who came to multiple events. One more thing, I will put this video, it's not up anywhere right now, but I will put it on my Vimeo. Is that still a popular thing? I don't have a YouTube uh, anymore, but I'll put it on my Vimeo, which I, um, is David Wisher. So um, a lot of my stuff on my website is linked to my vi uh, Vimeo. So there's only four David Wishers in the US. You'll be able to find it. <laughs> there's only two Lisa Wickers. That's, That's nice. Amazing. That's convenient. That helps out. With Christopher, thank you. Yes, thank you no so problem. much. To all the Christophers. Yeah, uh, Christopher Byrne behind the scenes as well. Uh, awesome. Okay, so we're going to uh, turn things off, turn the music back on, and uh, David and Lisa are going to hang out in the chat for a handful of minutes after this. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye.